Sandra and I have known each other for some time now, going back to uh, my uh, time as a, a provost now, uh, thinking uh, those years seem like just yesterday, but they were actually a long time ago. And I guess you could say I'm a recovering academic at this point, um, sober for uh, well, 14 years at least at this point. Um, but at any rate, Sandra, as you all know, is one of the international leaders of the anti-fracking movement. And uh, while she was the distinguished scholar at Ithaca College, and now she's the senior scientist at a uh, physician, uh, I'm sorry, at um, the Science and, and Environmental Health Network. At any rate, it, uh, Sandra is uh, now getting involved in uh, this whole issue of a nationwide carbon capture pipeline, which when I first heard about it, um, just my head exploded. Um, but uh, so I thought, boy, I, I, I need to reach out to Sandra and see if we get her to come to Tickby and, and talk about some of the issues around this proposed idea. Um, and, and so uh, she's agreed to be here this morning. And I, I hope, Sandra, that you got some sense of the range of, of, of folks we have here, um, all very engaged uh, in the community. Um, and I know eager to hear uh, what you have to say uh, this morning about, about the proposed uh, carbon capture pipeline. So with that, I am going to turn it over to you. Okay, and thank you, Peter. Um, I never want to miss a chance to actually um, thank Peter for kind of launching my whole life as a um, scientist in the public interest. Peter brought me in 2003 to Ithaca College from Cornell and created this wonderful position that I held for 18 years as a distinguished scholar in residence, which gave me uh, an opportunity to really bring um, good science to um, our students, but also to frontline communities and to partner with journalists and filmmakers and writers um, to kind of change the narrative around the way we talk about the environment. And that's work that I still do. So thank you, Peter, for kind of putting my feet on the path that I'm still walking along. Um, now that I'm um, no longer at Ithaca College, my, in my new role as a, um, a so, uh, senior scientist at Science and Environmental Health Network, I'm working for a shop Whose, um, whose charter it is to provide good science to frontline communities who are um, dealing with oil and gas extraction. And we have attorneys um, as well as physicians and scientists on staff. So that means um, the other half of what SIN does is provide legal resources to um, those same communities. So um, that um, it's been really enriching for me um, as sad as I was to leave academia to um, now be part of a community that not only includes um, scientists, but also attorneys who kind of look at these things in a little bit different way. And I think in a really, it, bringing science and law together is a really powerful combination. I've, I always imagine it a little bit like embroidery, um, that science is kind of the, the pile of yarn, um, the data. And if it's just that, if that's all it is, it just sits in the corner and doesn't do anything. But if you put, if you thread the needle of law with the thread, the thread of science, you can actually embroider a picture, which is policy, which is the world that we want to live in. Um, so that's kind of my new life. And on my, in my first part of my portfolio, and I should say, I only started this new position on um, June 1st, so I'm new, new at this. Um, but we are taking up both from a legal perspective and a science perspective, the risks and harms of this new thing on the horizon, that is the sort of new lifeline that's being thrown to the oil and gas industry, which is called carbon capture and storage, which is not you know, a very dull sounding name compared to the other thing I've been working on all these years, which is fracking. Um, but it, it represents a pretty big um, threat to the communities where it's being practiced, um, and also um, 
is a, a dangerous distraction from all the work that we are all collectively involved in, which is um, trying to transition away from dependency on fossil fuels. It essentially throws the fossil fuel industry a lifeline, which is why they're all in favor of it as a method for um, confronting the climate crisis, even though it doesn't actually do that. So I want to kind of take you back in time to start us off here. Well, before I do that, let me just say that I'm not going to give a fancy kind of bullet pointed PowerPoint presentation. I am also very new at study, studying this issue. Um, I'm just getting started. And so I really just want to have a conversation with you. Um, and um, this is actually my very first public presentation on this issue. Uh, so I'll share with you what I know so far, but there's um, just as fracking before CCS, this technology is coming at us with immense speed that really can't be um, overstated. Um, lots and lots of work have happened very quietly and cunningly behind the scenes for years to position this as um, the major way forward in a policy perspective by the Biden administration with lots of public tax money um, going for it and all kinds of credits. And so even though it act, and what I wanna argue today is that it doesn't make sense biologically, it doesn't make sense economically. Um, and yet, as we all know, things that are not rational, <laughs> again, fracking was a great example, that are false solutions that we're told are the bridge to the future, but actually make everything worse and entrench this stuff further, CCS is like that. So if you can take yourself back in time to you know, 2009, 2010, and remember how fracking was being pitched to us at that time and what it turned out to be. That's the story of CCS all over again. Um, okay, so let me, um, let me kind of tell you what it is and then uh, share with you sort of five myths about it. Um, and then we can just have a conversation. Um, I put in the chat, not only my email address, but also um, a link to, I think one of the best documents and sort of briefing documents that has, I've seen yet in all the work I've been doing for the last month on this, which is a new briefing from um, CL, the Center for International Environmental Law, um, who's kind of taken the lead on this. So a lot of what you're gonna hear me say comes out of that document and then in addition, my little shop, the Science and Environmental Health Network, is also we're doing our own sort of um, collective investigation, scientists and journal and um, lawyers together. And so, so some of what I have um, comes from our in-house work too. Okay, so carbon capture and storage some, is sometimes car, called carbon capture utilization and storage. So the acronyms are either CCS or CCUS. I'm just going to refer to it as CCS. And essentially it's um, a process that collects carbon dioxide from high emitting sites and then transports the captured carbon dioxide to so other sites where that uh, CO2 is either used for some other purpose um, or that's the utilization piece when it's referred to as CCUS or it's actually stored underground um, with the idea of that it will stay there forever. <clears throat> so. I wanna now look at um, whether it actually does any of those things. So the, to the first issue, does it work to actually lower carbon dioxide emissions? Because that's the main claim about C, um, CCS. And it, it does not. I mean, that that is like super clear. Um, this is like the least nuanced thing about CCS. It just doesn't do the major claim that it, it, it um, that it's, is its whole reason for being. And that is for two reasons. And the, the, in, the first one is sort of the indirect reason, um, which is that it's super expensive and it therefore diverts investment and government subsidies away from simply deploying renewables and delays the replacement of um, fossil fuel infrastructure with the kind that we all are pushing for. Um, so it's a ball and chain around renewable deployment um, so for that reason alone, it does not lower emissions, right? Um, but more directly, um, it, uh, it, the, it's um, very crafty because 
80% of the CO2 that is captured in current CCS technology and, and that's being proposed is not actually stored, but it's utilized. And what it's utilized for um, is for enhanced oil recovery, um, which is another acronym, um, E-O-R. And so in other words, the oil industry gets to use the captured CO2 to inject into depleted oil wells to make oil come to the surface. In that sense, it's, it's very parallel technology in its purpose to fracking. Fracking uses our drinking water as a club to smash shale apart so that bubbles of oil and gas more easily flow to the surface. In this case, we're not fracking with CO2, but the CO2, um, and it's specifically used for oil, not so much for gas is my understanding. Um, and the, the idea is that the CO2 makes the uh, oil less viscous and, um, and helps it um, come to the surface. And then of course the industry claims that it will recapture that CO2 also, um, but obviously we're facilitating bringing fossil fuels out of the ground using carbon capture techniques. So the net result is not gonna be lower emissions. And in fact, CCS entirely ignores the other climate villain, which is not carbon dioxide, which is methane. So everything that CCS does when it um, is used to en enhance um, oil extraction, even if you believe the hype that every single molecule of CO2 can be recaptured, um, you're still increasing methane emissions um, because every time you drill oil or gas, well, there are methane leaks. There's no engineering that is um, is out there that is makes it possible to capture methane. And of course, methane levels in our atmosphere are surging. Um, and um, all the science tells us that we can't simply go after CO2 alone and get to climate stability without um, decreasing methane emissions. So any technology um, that increases our methane emissions is um, taking us in, in the wrong direction. And so the CCS is very specifically only for carbon dioxide and doesn't, um, I think I'm hearing, I'm hoping somebody can mute their phone because I'm hearing a lot of hearing three years out of date, the prescription. Peter, is there a way that you can mute everyone? I okay. forgot how good these masks are. Um, it's somebody on an iPhone, I think. Um, okay, I'm just gonna keep trying to talk. Um, so uh, so the, my, I guess my main point here is that um, CCS does not even claim to do anything about methane emissions and in practice will make methane emissions worse. So for that reason alone, um, it should simply be, you know, that should um, make it not um, a legitimate way forward. Um, I mean, the science shows us that it would, even if it worked, which it doesn't, which I'll show you in a minute, um, it, it, it would fail to bring us to climate stability. Um, and um, it's not just a few of us in, Science and Environmental Health Network who are making these claims. In fact, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, C uh, IPCC itself, um, in their analysis, um, says that we we that any pathway to um, trying to limit warming to below 1.5 um, degrees that includes CCS can't get us there. That CCS um, always makes things worse in terms of trying to achieve the kind of reductions that we need at the time scale we need to keep warming below 1.5 degrees. So it's, uh, um, I think it's a good talking point that um, as the, um, the outfit with the most kind of credibility on the science of climate change, the IPCC itself is opposed to um, caption, carbon capture and storage. All right. So the other thing to know about CCS is that it makes air pollution actually worse rather than better. And that's because it removes CO2 from heavy industries that are CO2 intensive like steel mills or coal burning power plants, but it doesn't remove any of the other toxic air pollutants that cause harm to human health. And because it requires, CCS requires more energy, so capturing the carbon from those high polluting places 
um, cre uh, requires more energy than if you didn't capture the CO2. Even though you, even if you could capture all the CO2, you are going, you have to run energy generating things like you have to have a gas fired power plant to run the um, the CCS capturing thing for the steel mill. So all of the local air pollutants that the people who live in the community have to breathe, those are all left in place. And in fact, those concentrations go up. So we're talking about higher level of air pollutants with caption, carbon capture storage technology from, um, in, uh, from places like steel mills, cement factories, petrochemical manufacturing, aluminum smelters, and ethanol distilleries. Those are all some of the leading um, activities for which CCS is proposed. Um, and then third, I wanna talk about how the, this CO2 is transported. Um, so overnight, if we were to roll out um, carbon capture and storage in the way that the Department of Energy now has pr formally proposed that we do, um, CO2 would become the number one hazardous liquid by mass that we would be transporting across the United States um, through pipelines. Um, it will greatly exceed all of the volume and mass of the oil and gas combined that we're moving through pipelines across the United States. Um, and, and that's because of just the sort of the chemistry of, of reactions, right? So when you burn a ton of coal, you actually get two tons of CO2 out because the carbon is combined with oxygen. And so um, if you take all that CO2 and put it in a pipeline, it's just a massive volume of stuff. So the amount of pipelines that are gonna have to be constructed, the infrastructure for this um, is just like something we've never seen. It will greatly exceed the infrastructure build out from oil and gas pipelines. And those are gonna be very different kinds of pipelines because CO2 can be compressed into a liquid and it will be transported not as a gas, but as a liquid, right, through these pipelines. Um, um, and you can, you can create it in liquid form just through pressure. And remember, you can't do that with natural gas, right? There is such a thing as compressed natural gas, but that's um, not how we move it through pipelines. It's just moved as a, as a vapor, not as a liquid. And if you wanna liquefy natural gas, and that is a thing, LNG, um, you have to use cryogenics, not just pressure, to bring it down to many hundreds of degrees below zero in order for methane to turn from a vapor into a liquid. But with carbon dioxide, you can simply use pressure to turn it. You could, you could make dry ice just with pressure too, um, but in, it's, it travels actually in liquid form through these pipelines. Um, that's the proposal. Um, however, CO2, if it reacts with water or any water vapor at all, any humidity, will creates carbonic acid. And that's something we already all know, I think, because that's why our oceans are acidifying, right? So remember that we've loaded up the atmosphere with about 40% more CO2 than previously existed before industrial times. And because things just um, equilibrate, some of that CO2 is dissolved into the ocean. And when you dissolve CO2 in water, it turns into a weak acid called carbonic acid. So we have acidified the ocean by about 30%. And that is why we're losing a lot of marine life because anything with a shell, which is made out of calcium carbonate, goes into solution when the pH, the acidity level falls to a certain level. And that's why uh, the ocean is on track to uh, for mass extinctions. And we're all really worried about that. Well, the same phenomenon happens in CO2 pipelines. If there's any water in there, if there's any humidity at all, you get carbonic acid created, which means you get corrosion. So there are, is a higher um, risk for um, leaks and catastrophic blowouts. And so these pipelines have to be lined with uh, anti-corrosive agents like chrome. So they're very hot, they have to be very high quality pipelines. They're very, they're more expensive to produce. They're more energy, um, they're, um, they require more energy to produce as well. And they're kind of big 48 inch uh, pipelines that would be lined with something like chrome to prevent this kind of corrosion. 
Um, and then lots of energy has to be expended at the front end to make sure you remove as much water vapor as possible before you put the CO2 in that pipeline. Um, and, um, and so that means that the communities um, that these pipelines are going to pass through are at high risk. Because so that, that raises an issue of environmental justice, which I want to turn my attention to now for a couple of minutes. Um, if a CO2 pipeline should have a catastrophic rupture, and I do have a video to show you at the end of um, what happened in Mississippi um, in the year 2020 when there was such a rupture. Um, and I should say, I'll say right now, there were 300 people evacuated, 46 people went to the hospital, um, including three, three men who just passed out in their, while driving their cars. Um, when you breathe in high levels of CO2, it works in your, our bodies as an asphyxiant. So you'll just go into a coma and die. And it also messes around with our hearts. And so you can go into cardiac arrest. Um, and before you do that, often it creates delirium. So in this particular case in Mississippi, a sheriff was just driving down the road and saw people that he said it was like the zombie apocalypse, kind of staggering around, foaming at the mouth in delirium. He had no idea what they had been exposed to. And he tried to kind of rescue them and get them in the car. And then he also ended up kind of getting overcome. Um, happily, no one died um, in that situation, but it gave us, it certainly gave us some information as, as to what kind of risks these CO2 pipelines um, propose for the communities that they will run through. And of course, this becomes immediately an environmental justice issue because the places like coal, coal plants, um, steel mills, cement manufacturing, petrochemical facilities, aluminum smelters, ethanol distilleries, the places where those facilities are located um, where and, and the places where the pipelines will run tend to be environmental justice communities. They're located in brown, black, and indigenous um, neighborhoods um, or rural, um, poor white neighborhoods. Um, so in, environmental justice communities are already speaking out against this, um, especially because um, Southern Louisiana is targeted as one place where the uh, CO2 will um, be carried. So that will be the sort of terminus of a lot of CO2 pipelines, as is the Gulf Coast of Texas. Um, there's a big, um, the state of North Dakota has already volunteered to serve as the nation's repository for CO2 from throughout all over the, especially the Midwest. So there's pipeline projects planned there, and, and some of them will go along the pipeline of the Dakota Access Pipeline corridor uh, under the, you know, the argument that the um, whatever they needed to do to get access to that land um, through eminent domain has already been gotten. So this is how <clears throat> communities like once one thing like the, the Dakota Access Pipeline goes through, then they become sacrifice zones for all these other kind of dangerous things that follow. Um, okay, I want to spend a couple of minutes looking at what happens when we when you put this stuff up, when it gets done in the pipeline and then you pump it under the ground. And, he, and the, here's where I don't have much to say because there's just huge unknowns and the, sh and the short answer appears to be the, that the ultimate fate of CO2 over long periods of time depends on a lot about the parent rock that you put it in. So if you put it in sandstone, that's you, different, there are different risks that happen than if you put it in basalt and so, and so on. And a lot of times these things are going into depleted oil fields and so I don't have a really good answer for you, except that it looks to me like trying to sequester something using deep geological strata as a kind of storage locker for immortality is not a good idea. Um, I, what I keep reading in all the proposals from industry is that, quote, eventually the liquid gas will harden or dissolve. Well, hardening or dissolving are two very different fates. Um, I don't get it. Um, it doesn't, <laughs> use my grandmother's words, it just doesn't sound good to me. Um, but that's about as um, far as I've gotten in my um, investigation of this stuff. We do know that it will require about 100 years of monitoring to make sure there are no leaks. But so far, there's no like system worked out for like, what about liability if there is a leak? Or like, what what's the fix if there's a leak? Um, and who's gonna monitor this for a hundred years? And, and is there money in the budget to do that and so on? Um, 
We know that in Illinois right now, um, they are proposing to pump the CO2 into different formations, but then they realized that that would change the underground pressure in ways that um, caught somebody's attention as kind of alarming. And so the new proposal now is to, to remove the brine to make way for the CO2 so that they don't like pressurize everything too much. Um, but then the problem now is what are they do gonna do with the brine that they've removed to make way for the CO2? So now they're coming up with a solution for the brine. One of my worries as an ecologist is what's gonna happen um, ecologically underground, um, especially since we know CO2, if it comes in contact with water, turns into carbonic acid. And we know that will continue if there's any um, moisture in these underground formations. Um, and there's some um, evidence in the literature I've been able to ferret out showing that when you lower pH in underground formations through the, through the creation of carbonic acid, you end up mobilizing heavy metals that would otherwise be trapped in the rock. But when you lower the pH, they're free. We're talking about things like um, radioactive elements, arsenic, lead, all the things, you know, the, our, our ge geological world contains a whole periodic chart of elements. And it looks like those can start being mobilized and no longer trapped in the rock if you mess around with the pH. So that's something that is an issue of ongoing interest to me. And I'm kind of trying to research all that. Um, like, can that then get into groundwater? Um, I don't know the answer yet. Okay, there's another form of CCS called direct air capture, which is not so much an attempt to trap CO2 from um, heavy industry and coal burning power plants, but rather just as a sort of magical vacuum cleaner, take CO2 out of the air um, and then store it as rock or in some sort of dissolved form under the earth, um, independent of, um, of industry itself. So we'd just be sort of siphoning it, sort of filtering it right out of the air. Um, and um, these projects, uh, show no, in real life, show no um, ability to, to uh, work um, on, on this kind of scale that we would need. And they're certainly not more efficient than, let's say, plants um, for capturing CO2, and they all require energy to do so. So there have been proposals that, well, what if we ran those um, you know, CO2 vacuum cleaners in the atmosphere with renewable energy? Well, you could do that. Um, the problem is that that renewable energy would be better spent if we if it was used to replace a coal burning power plant or shut down some other fossil fuel thing. So if you're using, if you're deploying renewable energy, you know, you only have so much money in your budget. You only have so many, so much um, resources to make solar panels and wind turbines. And if you're using them to power uh, va vacuum cleaners sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, you get less bang for your buck in terms of um, emissions reduction than if you use those same things to rapidly phase out um, um, fossil fuels with renewable power. So I think that's the main objection to that um, direct air capture. I suppose if you wanted to think about this as an order of operations, if we got done with the task of replacing fossil fuel um, generating power, um, with all renewables, and we still realize that we're, we, we haven't yet gotten down to um, the, the, you know, the level of emissions. We haven't pulled up, uh, uh, out enough CO2 and methane out of the atmosphere to save us from going over the cliff into un, unchangeable tipping points. That, then there might be a role for carbon capture. But I would say right now, um, when we're still burning fossil fuels more every year, um, it's, an, it's the exact wrong thing to do. Um, it, so I think timing is, is the thing here. And there's, I don't see any role for direct air capture of carbon right now. It just seems to compete with what we need to really be doing. Okay, my last point is that in real life, um, I took a look at pilot projects to see if they're even feasible, like what, how are they doing? And I couldn't find any that were success stories. Um, they have, this hasn't been proven feasible in terms of the science or in terms of the economics when they uh, are done at scale. 
So there are now currently 28 um, carbon capture storage facilities operating globally. Um, only 19% of the carbon that they capture is actually sequestered in geological strata. The rest is used, as I said, to produce more oil. Um, there have been, there was one um, carbon capture storage at a coal plant near Houston that has failed uh, to meaningfully reduce emissions. It promised that it would capture 90% of the carbon dioxide. It only captured 7% when it was working at its best. And it has subsequently shut down because it was just um, too expensive to operate. Um, and in um, Australia, most recently, just last week, it was the, making headlines, the world's largest capture and, uh, carbon capture and storage project uh, just admitted that it had um, completely failed there. Um, so nevertheless, uh, no matter how um, full of failure and how irrational this thing is, as we know with fracking, these things can keep coming barreling right at us and we can't um, not object because we think that, um, oh, this is so dumb, it will never get off the ground. Um, because you can prop these things up with all kinds of tax credits and subsidies and they and um, and and it will just keep coming at us, um, and I, and that seems to be where we're at, friends. I'm sorry to report. Um, the biggest beneficiaries for CCS projects are oil companies who are using getting tax credits to inject CO2 into the ground to extract more oil. So that tax credit that they're getting, and they get to then claim that they're saving the the climate, um, is a, essentially a fossil fuel subsidy, as far as I can see. Um, which is why I think the biggest proponents of CCS technology are oil, gas, and petrochemical companies and the utilities. Um, so to summarize here, CCS, not necessary, not effective, not economic, not safe, just props up fossil fuels, gives them a lifeline, um, distracts us from the business of transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, and yet here we are, it's, I think it's a huge problem. I do not have any asks for you, which is unusual. You know me, um, went back in my New Yorkers Against Fracking days, I never concluded any presentation without telling people to get on the bus with me at 3.30 in the morning and go do something. Um, but um, I'm essentially here just to say we need to start a counter narrative about CCS. Um, so I'm going to, how are we doing on time, Peter? Do I have time to share my screen? Yes, we, you do. Okay. All right, um, so I'm going to just show you two things. Um, one is, <laughs> they still have a very messy <laughs> thing going on here. I am sorry. Let's see if I can. You can see all of my emails I haven't answered. Why? I got very good at this when I was teaching to make sure I had everything where I wanted it. Here we go but I didn't have a chance to do that today. There it is. There it is. Okay. So I think this is the most, um, this is the, the link I put in the chat for you. This is a briefing paper from our friends at the Center for Environmental, Center for International Environmental Law. Um, and it's the most kind of up-to-date um, briefing paper on um, CCS technologies and a lot of my talking points today came from this document so I would commend that to your attention um, and then I wanted to show you a um, two-minute video if I can do my technology here and this is from that Yazoo County Mississippi gas um, carbon dioxide leak when a, um, a pipeline catastrophically ruptured um, two years ago and I had it all queued up, but I see it's not. So we'll probably have to sit through. No, here it is. Um, let's see if this works. People in Yazoo County are looking for answers after a ruptured pipeline sent dozens to the hospital. 16 WAPT's Ross Adams was there when the pipeline company met with people in that area. We're here tonight to really talk about public safety. Dunbury Enterprises hosted a Sunday night community meeting at Shatarsha Baptist Church to try to quiet residents' fears. I knew about all the, the wells and stuff up there, but I didn't realize 
just how dangerous it could be. Many are on edge after the company's pipeline ruptured over the weekend near their homes in Yazoo County. We're very happy that you know, the air monitoring that we've done shows that, you know, everybody can now return to their homes. The pipe break forced 300 residents to evacuate. 46 people were sent to the hospital. I just couldn't breathe. I thought I was going to die. I really thought I was going to die. Dunbury said the 24-inch pressurized pipe expelled carbon dioxide into the air Saturday night. The mayor, who said she's a registered nurse, told residents it's not as bad as it sounds. It's a natural chemical in our bodies. So it's not a poison that's going to infiltrate you and eventually kill you. But don't tell that to Casey Sanders. Sanders said the fumes were so strong, they knocked her off her feet. When I got to my car, I collapsed and was unconscious for I don't know how long. I made it to my car. I could hear my husband screaming. We got to the stop sign in Cesarsha, and I blacked out again. Bernieva Lewis said two Vicksburg firefighters rescued her son and nephew after the fumes made them sick. They were unconscious the whole time. Someone found them. They had to break the windows out of the car to get them to safety. Residents now worried about the long-term health effects of breathing in CO2. Just feel like you're going to pass out, you know, and just real dizzy. And with him, I mean, his breathing, real bad breathing. Ross Adams, 16 WAPT News. Uh, the Okay. Um, well, I just want to correct what you heard from the nurse there. She's uh, uh, not, as uh, my understanding of the toxicology of CO2 is that that's not right at all. CO2 is a powerful cellular poison in our bodies. That's why we exhale it. Um, it's, um, we actually have um, CO2 detectors in the carotid arteries of our bodies. And if you try to hold your breath and CO2 begins to build up in your body, that um, feeling that at, at some point, no amount of willpower will allow you to kill yourself by holding your breath that your your the part of your brain will take over because it's getting messages from those co2 detectors in your carotid arteries we don't measure our bodies don't measure oxygen levels they measure co2 and that's because it is toxic to us at, at a certain level you're never in our bodies were never built to inhale co2 so just because we create it as a waste product from our own metabolism doesn't mean it's not poisonous to us. In fact, that's why we exhale it. So I just want to correct what you heard from the nurse. Um, and it looks, and I'm in the process of re researching more about CO2, um, it, it breathing in high levels of CO2, more than just being in a stuffy room, right? But um, many parts per million higher than that. And there are, um, you know, it messes with the pacemaker mechanism of your heart. It can throw you into cardiac arrest. Um, but the kind of de delirium um, appears to have like neurological impacts. And I'm interested to know whether they, it might have permanent impacts or not. And then last detail to know is that oftentimes um, hydrogen sulfide gas, which is H2S, um, is carried along with CO2 when it's captured. So when a pipeline ruptures, you're not just breathing in um, carbon dioxide at high levels, you're also um, breathing in hydrogen sulfide gas, which is um, also creates unconsciousness and is a, is a toxicant. So it can ma magnify the effects of the CO2. Uh, I also learned recently that CO2 as a gas is heavier than air, so it will hug the ground. Um, and um, that's why uh, it doesn't disperse easily. I, I, that surprised me, I didn't know that. And so that's why if there's a pipeline rupture, it can, um, it can uh, the CO2, which was a liquid, can immediately expands very quickly. It stays low. And so it can affect a lot of people within several mile radius of wherever the breach is. And that's it for me. Thanks so much um, for your attention. I realize this is a, not one of my more eloquent um, speeches, but that represents me at the very beginning stages of my thinking on this. Um, and um, I think it really matters. I think it's a really big thing that the, um, is having a lot of momentum because it's the one thing that blue states and red states are agreeing on. So Biden administration is reaching out to um, state legislatures like and governors like in Mississippi, like in North Dakota, and they can shake hands on this. We can't agree on anything else, but um, Democrats and Republicans seem to think that CCS is the way they can get agreement for the infrastructure project, 
for a way forward on climate and so forth. So it's a, it is a big deal, even though it makes no sense. Over to you, Peter. Thanks so much, Sandra. Uh, you know, as a uh, 19th century U.S. historian by training, I, I have to say, uh, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Um, just remarkably bad idea uh, from my perspective, and I think you've outlined very clearly why. Um, and I hope uh, folks can see why when I heard about this, my head exploded. Um, but we have to do more than, than uh, experience exploding heads. We have to figure out uh, a, a way to approach this. And, and I think what you've laid out for us, Sandra, is a really clear picture of uh, why we need to uh, uh, confront this and, and once again, uh, come up against uh, the fossil fuel industry, because this is, uh, as I said in, in, in the chat, it's, uh, it's like being trapped in a bad episode of The Walking Dead. Um, CO2 uh, inhaling, inhalation or, or not. Um, so what I wanna do is, if, first of all, give everybody the opportunity uh, to ask Sandra questions. It, I, I, most folks um, muted yourself. If you have a question uh, where uh, you can't unmute yourself, um, just let me know in chat and, and I'll, I'll unmute you. But I think 99% of the folks here were unmuted, them, uh, were muted themselves. So you can unmute yourself. Um, Questions? Just go ahead if you if you've got one, or you can you can use your reaction. Uh, this this is Amy. I, I have a quick question. I don't know if um, if if you've heard yet because it's something I've been curious about. Is which uh, you mentioned how blue state and red states have um, uh, seem to be coalescing around this, but. Can you speak to whether or not there's any major or which major environmental organizations are also expressing support for this? Have you heard of, of any that um, are also falling in line, if you will? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I don't, I, I haven't looked at that um, exhaustively, but um, it, it, I have seen semi-friendly statements from, um, Nature Conservancy and Environmental Defense Network. Not, is that EDF? A fund. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and there's been sort of silence otherwise, right, by the major, the big green groups. So um, not sure what that's about, um, if they're just playing a wait and see game, but... Um, there, uh, CL um, had a big sign-on letter uh, against carbon capture and storage. You probably saw it, it was a full page ad a couple of weeks ago in the Washington Post, and another one in uh, the Ottawa, uh, whatever their newspaper of record is in Canada. Um, and there were uh, a lot of, that was widely circulated. So a lot of um, groups signed on opposed to CCS. So you, you can look at that letter right. and kind of see the ones that have um, come out against it. Um, I am worried about the big greens who have a track record of um, not coming out against things like fracking in order to, you know, to maintain access to the Democratic Party, essentially. Um, Sandra, uh, folks have asked if you could uh, provide the link to uh, the CCUS report in, in I'm not chat. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what they mean by that. The CL report uh, is, I did provide the link. So if you go up to the yeah. top of the chat, it's there. Okay. Yeah, C, uh, CCUS refers to, is an acronym for Carbon Capture Utilization sure. Storage. Okay, I think that might be it. Yeah. Um, so we have a, 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 a question um, and I'm sorry for having to lean over because my vision isn't, uh, as good as it should be. Um, there's, uh, let's see, a question from uh, Kathleen Banford. Are growing trees and healing 
soil, not options for carbon sequestration. Well, that is certainly what um, Physicians for Social Responsibility, who is one of the organizations who are coming right up front with um, um, good statements. Again, they're one of the big greens that have come out against CCS. And so just yesterday, I believe it was, um, Physicians for Social Responsibility LA had a kind of teach-in about this, a webinar. Um, and they, uh, sp they released a statement. Um, let me see what, if I wrote that down. And they did say that um, what they're proposing as an alternative is to use um, uh, regenerative agriculture and, um, and forestry as practiced by indigenous peoples, the forest management techniques. Um, and apparently they're referring to some actual policy, um, not a generic idea, um, that, that that, that uh, is much better carbon ca capture option than um, what's being proposed with th these technologies. I mean, I have to say, I that sounds right. On the other hand, what we're seeing right now out west with the mass destruction of trees through forest fires means that with climate change, trees can also release a lot of CO2, right? So if if we're thinking that we can offset carbon by big polluting industries by letting them plant some trees somewhere, um, and then those trees all end up in a massive fire, then it, it doesn't work. Yeah, and, and my understanding too is, is that one of the scary <clears throat> tipping points that we've at least crept up on, if not past, uh, is the uh, fact that the uh, Amazon uh, rainforest basin is is now a net emitter of greenhouse gas rather than uh, the carbon sink that we all think of it as, and that that's uh, a result uh, in large part uh, of uh, deforestation and the kind of uh, large scale wildfires um, that you've you've mentioned, Sandra. So. Um, that's that's certainly something to keep in mind. But I, I think the, the point you, you've made uh, that the, the so far, at, at any rate, uh, the, the best, most effective carbon storage techniques have been uh, invented by nature is, is probably a good one. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the way to say it. And I always want to give a shout out to our phytoplankton stocks, right? We always think of trees as being the big photosynthesizers, but in fact, uh, more than half, like our oxygen supply um, comes from two sources, trees and uh, plankton. And of the two, plankton give us more. Um, it's a little more than half. So if you imagine that with every breath you breathe, you're breathing in two pints of atmosphere. Um, the oxygen in one of those pints comes from uh, uh, carbon uh, trees and the other comes from the world's phytoplankton. And the phytoplankton stocks are also in trouble now because uh, as well as the Amazon forest, they're not getting as much headlines. The phytoplankton stocks are in trouble because of warming surface ocean temperatures that inhibit mixing from colder upwellings. And that those colder upwellings are supposed to bring them up fish poop, which I would otherwise sink to the bottom of the sea but it serves as a kind of miracle grow for the phytoplankton that are drifting around on the surface. They lack, you know, roots or anything. Um, and every, everybody needs nitrogen. Um, and uh, that the plankton rely on these upwelling currents to provide it to them. But with um, these ecoclines that you get from higher surface water, they're not able to do that. So productivity of plankton is also falling, which is threatening our oxygen supply, but also what they're they're creating that oxygen supply, of course, as a waste product from photosynthesis. So they're also pulling carbon dioxide out of the air to do what they do um, and then give us oxygen in return. So that's something else that those of us who are paying attention to the oceans um, are concerned about. Yeah. And I see that Amy just put in the chat the, um, the uh, one page, um, ad that CL um, posted to the Washington Post. And I would actually refer you to that first if you wanna just get started or have a one pager to give to somebody um, rather than the, the briefing port, report, the, which I shared with you the link for that too, um, which is a, 
a much longer document. So yeah, I would def uh, I would definitely start with um, the link that um, Amy just posted there. Thank yeah, you, thanks. Thanks for that, Amy. Uh, I'm looking in chat to see if there, there are other questions. Um, certainly one of uh, the, the um, participants has, has noted that, that trees in their first 25 years of life are carbon negative or at least carbon neutral. But the problem, as you pointed out, uh, um, Sandra, that's, that's only as good for as long as the tree uh, is not burning. Um, and, and, and that's really the, the, a huge problem in the West uh, and, and it's, especially in the Southwest where there's been this mega drought now for two decades and, and plants uh, and the soil have dried themselves out so much that um, it's an even more explosive uh, situation right. than uh, uh, usual with a wildfire. And honestly, I don't think regenerative agriculture, as much as I'm a big fan of that for many other reasons, I don't think it's gonna, it's not a magic bullet for the climate. It's part of the solution, but it's a pretty small part of the solution. I mean, carbon, yes, can capture a certain, soil can capture a certain amount of carbon and hold it there for a long time. But at some point it doesn't keep absorbing carbon, it, it maxes out. Um, and also it's not at all clear to me with this big push, to lower our dependency on animal agriculture um, and move it to a plant-based diet, especially in a place like upstate New York, turning cow pastures, which are pretty good sequesters of carbon into let's say fields of oats for oat milk. As soon as you plow up pasture, you're releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that always gets left out. That whole, all these ecological things that I spend my days thinking about get left out of these kind of arguments about veganism versus eating um, animal products and how much, you know, what the CO2 footprint is and all that. I mean, land use really matters and um, turning pasture into row crop agriculture um, in order to save methane is like you're robbing Peter to pay Paul because then you're releasing a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, yeah, that's uh, an old story, isn't it? Rotting Peter to pay Paul, especially uh, when it comes to uh, late capitalism. Um, so I, 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 it looks to me like some folks are having trouble unmuting yourselves. I will say that I have, uh, through the security function, given you the capacity to unmute yourself. Um, I know, uh, Brian, it sounds like you may have a question, but I, I think if you unmute yourself, you can uh, ask that, ask the question. Um, yeah, Brian, you're still muted. Yeah, I don't know what what else to do, Brian, because um, I can un uh, all I can do is is give you the capacity to unmute yourself. Um, but let me see if uh, let's see. In the meantime, in the meantime, I have yeah, yeah. Why don't you comment? Yeah, let me say a couple of things. First of all. Um, uh, I agree completely with Susan, and uh, that it's crazy. I just have a little different slant. Oh, you mean Sandra? Sandra, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, Sandra. that's okay. I, I have a slightly different slant on on this all. Um, first of all, we have our civilization. We use energy at a huge rate, and we hope we're based on that. And that includes being, you know, eating meat, etc. Uh, it it uses up a lot of energy, which has to come from somewhere. <clears throat> And, and as, as far as this carbon capture business is concerned, it obviously is ridiculous, except if you happen to own a lot of carbon resources like oil, you know, have the rights to oil or coal, et cetera. That's the only reason it makes sense. You're trying to get something out of that, okay? Um, on the other hand, there's one, other, there's one other reason why our use of energy does need some kind of burning of something at present, you, there's no way you can solve, you can save enough. Oh, by the way, where should the energy come from? It's pretty obvious. We can get it from solar cells. We can get it from wind turbines, hydro to a certain extent, as long as it doesn't, you know, it, the hydro is short, short term in the sense that you eventually silt up your, your reservoirs and all, and it has other bad effects on agriculture. But the point is we, we can get it that way. 
So why are we, you know, besides the fact that people, oh, capitalists own certain resources and want to somehow get money out of them, except for that, the only other reason that you would want to get into using these high concentration fuels, uh, basically oil, um, is because of transportation. Uh, and now cars, we now have enough to make batteries that last long enough and the recharging structure is coming in so that they don't need to worry about cars anymore, but airplanes are another story. And that's a long way off. I'm not saying it's in the, in infinitely far off, but there's not any current idea of how to do this except for very short range aircraft, which are not the problem. Um, you can deliver drones with electric power. You might, people are building aircraft, maybe they go 100, 200 miles. Um, but that's, I'm not sure what the economics that are. I think they're not good and then won't be for a while, but they're, they're feasible at least. So that's, that's where the, why people want this stuff. Now, as far as putting the carbon back in any place, it doesn't make any sense except the way nature did it, but nature is too slow for us. So we're all sort of, all of us on earth who have a standard of living, like I'm sure everybody on this call are essentially all complicit in the fact that wanting to use a lot of energy all the time quickly um, and wanted to get on an airplane and go somewhere. Um, basically, that's the real underlying cause for all this and all this other nonsense about carbon capture comes because there are some people who think they can make some money out of that. And, and I agree, by the way, thermodynamically, it doesn't make any sense to pull carbon out of the air after you burn it and dilute it. So I don't know how many people, you know, sort of have an understanding of thermodynamics and stuff here, but basically if you take something and spread it out, mix it with everything else, it takes a lot more energy to get it back. So that's the direct carbon capture is completely nonsense, uh, energy wise. This taking it from a, a uh, power plant where it comes out in a concentrated form, getting into stuff makes a little, I'm not saying it makes sense, but it makes more sense, but then you have to the same problem that Sandra was talking about. What do you really do with it? And how do you make it stay somewhere forever, which you can't? So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Well, um, yeah, let me just respond a bit. I, I have a different view on what the root causes of our situation are, but I, I don't think that's necessary for us to agree on carbon capture and um, kind of roll out an alternative narrative and work together to stop this latest thing, just in the same way as we stop fracking as a false solution. But I wanna be very clear about one thing that you said, which is that the, all the data I have seen so far um, are um, unequivocal that carbon capture is a lifeline to the fossil fuel industry. It is not, um, it is slowing down their closure. All by itself, without carbon capture and storage, the price of um, energy that they are producing is going to become very quickly more expensive than what renewables can give for us. But if we give them our taxpayer dollars, and again, this is all being rolled out, not by private investment, but with taxpayer money, it's a subsidy to the oil and gas and coal power plants, and it will keep them going for longer than we have time. We don't have time for any more false solutions. And carbon capture and storage is not, was not developed as a good faith solution to the climate crisis that happens not to work very well. It was developed by the oil industry. It's their research dollars that gave us this technology. It is a bad faith mirage. It is, you know, a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's a false solution that is, was never developed in good faith, but now is being marketed by the Biden administration and is being accepted by Republican governors as the way that we are going to solve the climate crisis. That's the narrative that is driving this. I, I agree with you completely. There was a, one other thing involved in that is people think that this will create some kind of jobs, but of course they're jobs that are doing a bad thing, basically. I mean, they, yeah, they're, they're that's, 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 that's a good point. And the, I have not done the jobs analysis, but I have heard some numbers um, that, and it looks like, you know, the unions are all behind this, especially the pipe fitters unions. Um, and that's again, part of, why the Democratic Party has been captured by it. And so there's a 
whole labor analysis that needs to be done. I'm probably not the right person to do it, um, but I'm really interested in someone doing it because the um, renewable energy industry is notoriously kind of non-labor. And so the um, union folks are really pushing for CCS because they can get the, the unions on board. So that's, uh, and I mean, I, and I'm a labor girl. I came from a labor town. I would not have been able to graduate and get a PhD if I didn't have a graduate union. I was, a, was many of you know, a cancer patient when I was a graduate student and I needed health insurance and my labor union, the GEO got me that when I was a student at the University of Michigan, which is why I do this work anyway. So I do not like to be an, against the unions, but in this case, they are lining themselves up on the opposite side. And I know out in California, they're fighting this. Uh, the environmental justice groups are now heading off with the unions to try to stop this. And I hate it when, when those two groups are on opposite sides of each other. Yeah, and my understanding is, is that the AFL-CIO in particular is, is a major player in, in, in this effort. Um, so it's really un, unfortunate. Um, uh, Dan, uh, you you have a question or comment? You uh, need to unmute yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, I've undone everybody at this point. Um, so uh, all I can do is uh, unmute, give you the capacity to unmute yourself. There you go. Oh. Great. So, um, Sandra, I would like you to talk a little bit more about the counter narrative. Um, in the last few weeks, I've been focusing more on what the mainstream has, you know, the mainstream sound bites. I've been watching these um, presentations by the US Chamber of Commerce where they bring in five or six industry representatives, elected Congress people, PhDs in nuclear science from the Department of Energy, and they are 100% all about this technology. They use phrases like natural gas is the backbone of the clean energy economy. They bring in congressmen from um, states that are pro-labor, pro-union, uh, pro-gas uh, that just slammed Deb Holland. And I, I come away from some of these meetings sometimes just really needing to just go out for a walk and process what I've heard because they're so powerful. And I like that Al George mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, the forces of capitalism are what's at play here. And I've been reaching out to more mainstream environmental groups, just looking for more strategic ways that we can construct the counter narrative because it's not the science that we need to develop to move the sustainability agenda forward. It's the counter narrative that I think, I mean, I've been in the world of solar for many, many years and I, I still hear people say, well, and, and they say this on these Chamber of Commerce um, um, meetings, like, well, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And I'm just like, God, I can't believe they're using these antiquated phrases and getting away with it. The, the reason why they're getting away with it because they have the narrative. And so I know you're not asking us to get on the bus at 3.30 in the morning, but I would be willing to get on that bus with you. And if you have more suggestions for us or ideas or information to share, I would certainly like more um, guideposts in that endeavor. Yeah, well, I thank you, Dan. I'm not, you know, to be clear, I'm not holding anything back from you. If there were something I could invite you to be part of, um, I would do it. Um, this, we, we are late in coming, in realizing the threat that CCS poses to derail our collective effort to keep it in the ground and make this move away from fossil fuels. Um, this has been, I mean, I'm looking at these documents this has been planned for a long time. Um, so um, I, I would say that um, I'll just keep in touch with Peter. Um, I'm part of um, a consortium of scientists, attorneys, um, health professionals who are working now on CCS. So I should say that um, my um, new shop, the Science and Environmental Health Network, has convened a consortium of organizations to form a loose alliance 
we're talking among ourselves. We just um, formed task groups. So I'm part of the science task group, but there's also a messaging task group. Um, and we are going to be um, hosting more teach-ins. Um, I know I am gonna be speaking with um, Dr. Mark Jacobson from Stanford um, about why CS CCS is a false solution in a webinar on, I think it's the 7th of August. Um, then my group, Science and Environmental Health Network is going to be sponsoring a webinar to teach um, journalists and scientists more about CCS. We hope Mark will join us for that too. Um, so I'll just let you know uh, as these kind of online events um, will you know, em emerge. And then, it, I mean, at some point out of this, um, we should have a counter narrative. We should have action items, right? In the same way that we did with, with fracking. Uh, I mean, and look, I know this is big and overwhelming and it's coming right at us, but that's where we were at with fracking 10 years ago when it seemed inevitable, right? Remember that th there were actual headlines in upstate New York that said the shale gas army has arrived, resistance is futile. That, that was an actual headline I woke up to in around 2009. And it just required the rest of us to say, you know, the emperor has no clothes and we're gonna create the counter narrative. And we began by sticking the K in the word fracking. And that, and that provided us a really powerful way to get press attention. And uh, just by putting the K in there, it made it sound bad, right? So we, we need now to do that with CCS, which is this thing that's not nearly as dramatic as stuff that lights your tap water on fire, but which is super dangerous. And so I don't know what form that will take yet, but I'm trying to be um, on the, as a, as a kind of scientist and scholar, you know, it, in the public interest at this moment in history um, to bring all of my kind of brain power to creating that counter narrative. So I just want to let you know it's underway. Um, and um, at s some point soon, I'll be able to say, you know, in the way I used to say 10 years ago about fracking, join us, here's what we're doing. Um, I don't quite have that um, yet for you, but I, I feel like I will. And also want to remind us that we did ban fracking in New York. We did stop gas storage at Seneca Lake. We did close down the Cayuga power plant. All of those things were thought to be impossible. I, it is the honor of my lifetime to play a small role in all three of those victories and um, fully intending to play to win with uh, CCS, but mm. it's a monster and, and we'll all have to work together somehow with it on this. Yeah, Sandra, it, it, um, thanks for uh, making sure we all understand where we are with this in, in, in the very, very early days of trying to wrap our heads around uh, such a, uh, a complex uh, proposal. But if, if any information that you wanna uh, pass on to me, I, I can send it out to, to the list. So that, that um, all you need to do is email me and, and then I'll, I'll take it from there. Okay, and I'm I'll make sure you get invitations to the upcoming webinars that I know Great. are already on the calendar. Great, that's, that's excellent. So Dominic, you've, you've had your hand up for a while. Are, are you speaking uh, to us from Germany today? You need to unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, thanks for allowing me to unmute. Um, hey, Sandra. Um, uh, yeah, just wanted to thanks for your for your presentation and um, really inspiring. And, and I just wanted to say, you, you know, in addition to the um, CL report, what else could, would be helpful? I mean, you just eloquently answered it by, you know, could state and local elected officials do to learn more about this issue and get involved? Um, so just a standing offer to um, here to help with our network of elected officials uh, in 50 states across the country. Great. Uh, and, and I just want to point out to everyone that uh, Irene Weiser earlier in the chat put in a link to uh, a, the smog article, which is where uh, I first read about this. Um, and that I will be uh, saving the, the, the chat log and getting that out to everybody later today. Uh, Sandra. Yeah, and um, I wanted to let everyone know, but particularly Marissa, who's, um, again, my former student, but also one of the leaders in the um, Ithaca hub of 
um, Sunrise, that uh, I, it's come to my attention that C the CCS proponents are doing lots of outreach to youth climate groups, offering them lots and lots of money to get on board with CCS. Um, this was brought to my attention when I got an email from one of our um, finest youth climate leaders, Alexandria Villasenor, who's about, I think she's like 16. She has a huge platform. Um, she's with Earth Uprising. And she let me know that um, she was approached um, first by email, then with phone calls um, from uh, foundations that are associated with CCS promoters who are offering millions of dollars of grant money to um, youth in the climate movement groups. And she was asking like, why would my little group be offered this much money? Um, and I don't know what CCS is. So I'm also trying wow. to open uh, a line of communication with um, youth groups who are, you know, right now at the forefront of what's happening in, in Washington. And um, as the youth move toward um, making demands around um, jobs and forming a kind of civilian conservation corps like movement for climate, it just seems like CCS proponents have seen, have seen this as an opening to infiltrate, I'll, I'll just use that word, infiltrate the youth movement. So that's, I have a special interest in um, as I develop a more a, a counter narrative and an analysis of what's wrong with CCS of speaking directly to the um, to youth. Um, so Marissa, if you have any thoughts about how I can do that, um, let me know. You know, the other I word that comes to mind besides infiltration here is insidious. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like gas. It's like natural gas is the clean energy future, right? I mean, that's what where we were with this talk 10 years ago, and now it's carbon capture and storage. You could take the same script off the shelf, take out fracking and natural gas and put in CCS, and we're, we're replaying the same terrible drama. You know, we're watching the same play all over again, only we don't have time now. We didn't have time then, we have even less time now. There's like zero time for false solutions now and for diversion of resources and for building out Massive infrastructure, again, more hazardous liquids will be moving in the form of CO2 across our nation than even oil and gas. Once those pipelines are in the ground, I mean, so that's, that's either taxpayer dollars or investment dollars or something, um, they're not gonna be shut off. And that's just gonna keep these um, power plants, coal, natural gas, cement, petrochemicals, it's just gonna keep them going from, you know, it, they, they, it's time for this, it's, there's a curfew. This is curfew time. And, and now it allows the party just to keep on, you know, rolling forward. Yeah. Uh, Brian, you have a question. No, I just wanted to, to uh, make a, uh, a, I agree with Sandra here that the uh, fossil fuel industry is, is in desperate mode now. They're coming up with false solutions. Hydrogen is another one. I know some people here may believe in hydrogen but there's a lot of negative information about that. The other thing is I've been involved with in uh, trying to get the Public Service uh, Commission, Department of Public Service to plan for gas retirements. They're totally opposed to that. Uh, to bring them in line with the CLCPA, their argument is, well, it's 30 years until uh, we're supposed to be off gas. We may have a use for gas in 2050. You don't know, it's too far away for us to predict. And also, we may find other uses for the gas pipeline system. In the meanwhile, there will be people that will be getting off and electrifying. That will leave uh, the more uh, the folks who don't have the choice to get off and electrify paying a much higher cost because the gas infrastructure is very, very expensive. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just uh, that battle is being fought pretty hard across New York State. Most of the uh, environmental groups are involved in that now. We have a lot of uh, public officials involved in it, but it, it's a tough battle because the uh, utilities are protecting their business model and they're going to resist to the very end. Yeah, that's uh, a, a question that uh, or a point that Ann Rhodes in chat has touched on too, asking if there are any legislators who are alert to this issue and are fighting it. 
uh, at either the state or federal level? Well, once Dominic and I put our heads together, we will solve that problem. Um, but I, right now, I don't know specifically of any. Um, there's no like elected official that I know that's kind of taken the lead speaking out against CCS. So um, hope, hopefully that will change soon. Um, to, I did want to respond to Brian's point and let you know that there will be a paper coming out in another month or two with Bob Howarth and um, who's, you know, our, our own local guy here at Cornell and my neighbor um, and uh, Market Jacobson at Stanford um, showing the link between hydrogen and CCS. So the, um, it's all kind of under wraps right now because, uh, you know, you don't want to leak it and get industry all on the warpath about it. So but to speak. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I can't say more, but, um, but it is the case that, yes, hydrogen is not also a false solution, and hydrogen is mostly made from natural gas, and part of this whole, in fact, the whole reason we have this thing called blue hydrogen, which is being promoted as the green hydrogen, right, um, it, uh, it is because they're claiming that CCS will capture the carbon dioxide to make hydrogen, and that's why why it's blue blue as opposed to the old kind of hydrogen, which is called gray. Anyway, that's a whole world of the whole hydrogen is a whole world of study and rabbit hole you can disappear into. But the bottom line is that hydrogen is also not the not the solution. It all comes from methane. Yeah, and, and let's not forget the wind turbines that cause all that cancer, Sandra. Yeah. yeah well unbelievable it's just unbelievable um but really really appreciate your taking the time with us today um and as you can see people are really uh engaged in thinking about this so i'm i i i think this is one of the major reasons for uh tick bees uh being is is to bring these issues to the fore and help connect people with each other who can uh, then uh, help us uh, go from here. So uh, you've performed that role for us today, Sandra, in spades. And uh, hopefully um, I can keep uh, sending information out to folks and we can keep this in front of us. And uh, maybe at some point next spring, if uh, we can, we can come back together and, and, and see, uh, depending on how things evolve, if, if at that point uh, you have a, a 3.30 a.m. Um, uh, action item you can put in front of us. Yeah, maybe I will. And um, in the meantime, I will use you, Peter, as my link to this whole group. It's a real honor to speak before you. Also, as a retiree at Ithaca College, I get to keep my email address there. So um, you, you I did notice have, that. That's, yeah, that's my great. email address doesn't change. So you all probably, I feel like three quarters of you have emailed me about other things over the years. So you probably still have me in your contact list. So that, that can simply stay. Um, last thing, I spent yesterday in the Cayuga Medical Center having a colonoscopy. Um, as you know, I had bladder cancer at a young age. I also developed colon lesions by the time I turned 30. I had two polyps pulled out. Um, that I feel like that probably saved my life. So I see a lot of you are probably my age, which is 61 or more. So if you're over 50, um, go get your colonoscopy. Um, food tastes really good after you fasted for two days. So I was very happy to have this this morning. And, um, and glad to be with you and hope to have many more days ahead. Um, colonoscopies make my life possible, I think. And um, you're all as important as I am in this work, so go get yours. I do, yeah. it, without, I do it without drugs. I don't I, even get the sedation. I just came, I did my colonoscopy. I came back and started working on CCS. That's how I roll. So you all, um, we all need you in the fight. So colonoscopy is really, really great te screening technology. Make sure you got yours. Great. Thanks, Sandra. <laughs>